In this segment, we'll finish our discussion of strings and pointers, looking at the stir comp function and uh, some other string library concepts. So let's look at stir comp, which is a bit more complex than stir copy here. It takes two character pointers, just like uh, stir copy did, and it walks them down their respective strings using the for loop here on line 10. No initialization is needed since S1 and S2 already point to the start of their respective strings. So we'll draw in those arrows here, assuming that the call uh, we're dealing with is a uh, stir comp of string 1 and string 2 from line 25. Okay, so the incrementer in the for loop advances them each by 1 on each iteration. And by the way, a bit of for loop review in case it's needed here. Um, recall that all parts of a for loop header are optional, uh, though the semicolons must remain so it's clear what you omitted. If you omit the test, it's automatically true. So, for example, for with two semicolons and nothing else is a synonym for endless loop. And, of course, we can omit the, uh, increment, the initializer here uh, without trouble. Also, you can glue together two incrementing or initializing expressions in a for loop by joining them with a comma like I do in the incrementer here. Um, so technically the comma is an operator. Actually, it's a, a part of C's flexible definition of operators at work again there. It joins two expressions into one, and it has the value of the second expression, but no one ever uses it that way except in for loops where the value of the expression isn't an issue and, and only the side effect of assignment or incrementation is an issue. So you can think of it as a kind of boilerplate way to uh, uh, glue a couple of incrementers together in a, in a for loop. So the main complexity here is in the for loop test. I'm going to take that apart step by step. I'd like you to figure it out on your own as much as possible. So let's do a kind of guided tour in the form of in-lecture questions. And question number one would be, what do the first two terms here in the uh, for loop, those, uh, what do they test for? Try to summarize it in a very brief phrase of just four to five words. I mean, you can always read it off as code, but what, what's the meaning of that code exactly? And um, pausing and then coming back from a pause. The test, or they test, that neither S1 nor S2 are pointing to an ASCII null. And that, recall, of course, is a quote back zero. Uh, in other words, that neither string is done as we advance S1 and S2. So the short summary would be, neither string is done. The loop keeps going as long as neither string is ended. Yeah, that makes sense. So question number two, then. What about the final part of the test? Star S1 equal equal star S2. In the concrete example of professor and project that we're looking at here, exactly when will this loop exit, and where will S1 and S2 be pointing when it does? That all has to do with the meaning of that equal equal there. So again, pause until you're sure of the answer. When it will exit, how far it will go, and so forth. And then returning from the pause, th this test is going to be true as long as the targets of S1 and S2 are the same. Uh, the loop is designed to keep running as long as neither string has ended and the string contents are the same. In the case of professor and project, the loop will do three iterations, skipping over the P, the R, and the O in each of those two strings until it reaches respectively the J and the F. At that point, they won't be equal and the loop will exit. So question number three. With this exit condition as described, assuming that we get to the F and the J and then we bomb out of that for loop, what value does stir comp return? And is that the right value given the definition of stir comp? In general, what's the purpose of the subtraction down here on uh, line 13. So once again, a pause and return here. It returns the difference between the ASCII codes for F and J in our case, the targets of S1 and S2. And that'll be negative, since F is less than J in ASCII sequence, as it should be, because professor is less than project in lexicographic order. I mean, that's really the essence of lexicographic order, right? Find the first difference, and then whoever's letter is less, that's the lesser string. The return statement returns the difference between the first pair of letters for which the two strings differ, which is the pair that determines whether one string is larger than the other. And so we come to question four. 
what would it take for that return statement to return a zero? That's supposed to be a possible return value from StirComp. Where would S1 and S2 be pointing in that case? And it won't happen, of course, with the strings we've got. You'll have to have different string contents to make this occur. So again, pausing and thinking about it. What you should come up with is that the two strings would have to be identical. And the loop would end with S1 and S2 pointing to the null characters at their respective string ends. And then, of course, 0 minus 0 on line 13 is 0 as the return value. Stircomp returns a zero in this one case, and only in this case, where the two strings are identical. And then question five. What if we have strings like cat and catalog? How does Stircomp deal with that? Does it need a special case to work properly, uh, following the rule that uh, cat should be less than catalog, even though there isn't a letter in cat to match the A in catalog? Trace the code, then describe what happens. And specifically, you should come up with an answer to why this question shows, once again, that ASCII 0 was a really good choice for the end of string. Coming back from that pause, S1 would reach the null character right after cat, while S2 would be at the A in catalog. So in fact, there would be, in effect, a fourth letter for the A to compare against. It would be the null in cat. And the loop ends because one string is done, cat, and the return statement then returns the difference between the null and the a. And they have the ASCII values 0 and, in, in the case of lowercase a, 97, respectively. So as a negative return value uh, is correct, since cat is less than catalog. An ASCII code, any ASCII code, really, is greater than null. So if one string ends first, the other string's next character will always win in the subtraction. And the choice of ASCII 0 for end of string is, is perfect in this case. There's an interesting side point here, just for fun, regarding string comparison, and that is that the order of the characters, what is officially called the collating order, count that as a vocabulary term, is determined by their ASCII codes. In particular, this means that all capital letters, codes 65 to 90, from A to Z, in fact, are less than all lowercase letters, which are, in fact, codes 97 to 122. You'll often see computer-sorted word lists with all the capitalized words first for this reason. Now, in the 21st century, the concept of sorted order is broader still. Even among languages that use the Roman alphabet, the collating order is different. In a sense, every nation sings a different alphabet song, and modern languages like Java include logic to adjust the collating order per culture. Uh, 1970s vintage languages like C uh, sadly uh, do not. Now that we've covered stir-copy and, and stir-comp, let's return down to the main program here and look at uh, some of the lines of code. The stir comp call on line 25 here, which we just used as our example, is checking to see if the two strings that were entered differ by checking for a non-zero return value. They do differ, so the stir copy on line 26 here, which was our example from the earlier segment, copies project into string one. And the Printf on line 27 illustrates the outcome down here in the uh, sample run. Uh, string 1 is now project. Now, we've already discussed lines 30 through 36 as well in earlier segments when we talked about string constants and pointers. Be sure you follow those lines and their output, trace them carefully, and agree that by line 38 we'll have content like that shown here. String 1 will contain new data, and string 2 will contain project. Lines 38 through 43 show some more interesting uses of strings and the string library, and they introduce a couple of new library functions as well. On line 38, we pass string1 plus 4 to stir copy as the target. Well, this passes a pointer to the D in new data, which is the location, or at the location, string one's beginning address plus four characters. So stir copy here will copy stuff onto new data. And this is the effect we'll get. As the uh, our string one now contains new stuff as the uh, printf uh, down here uh, uh, output on line 53 shows. Now this is not yet another example of the principle that the string functions don't care where you get your pointers from. 
even if it's a pointer into the middle of the string. This sort of code can be useful in more creative string editing. Line 39 introduces a new library function called strcat. This works like strcopy, but it tacks the source onto the end of the target instead of overriding the target. So, for instance, in this case, string 2 would then contain project x, like that. Per usual, strcat just assumes the target has enough room for this. If it doesn't, that's your problem. Line 40 through 41 print out our string changes. That's the output for string 1 and, and string 2 that show their new values. Um, but uh, they also show the result of a strlen call, another library function which we're calling on string 2. Uh, strlen returns the number of characters in a string. It actually walks through and counts them, not counting the null. So string 2, for instance, has eight non-null characters, and uh, we get the length 8 in the output from that. Now, the final printf on line 43 is kind of a rogues gallery of interesting string pointer messing around. And we want to take that apart bit by bit. Okay? See if you can figure out why the final output line turns out as it does. It's line 54 down here. For instance, we've already seen that offsetting from the start of a character array gets you the address of a character within the string. So string 1 plus 4 points to the S in new stuff. And that explains the stuff at the start of the printed line. Printf, again, doesn't care where you got the pointer from. It just prints where you tell it from, to uh, print from. And question 6. What about the next parameter? Can we even write test string plus 5? Well, evidently so, because it does produce an output of string. But why is that exactly? And coming back from a pause, the answer you should come up with, again, is that test string is a pointer to the T in the string table, thus. It may look like a string constant, but it's converted into a character pointer to a string table entry. And like any pointer, it can be added to. So we're passing, by adding 5 to it, the uh, S in the test string from the string table, and that's what gets printed out. And question number seven then. What about NESW bracket three? Is that allowed? It, evidently, again, it is, is that it works, but prints W. And why is the format specifier a percent %C there instead of a percent %S like all the others? So pause again and think about that. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound on string constants, if NESW is in fact a pointer, to the n in the string table entry here now. And by the way, it wraps a line just because there wasn't room to put it all in one line in the box. There's no actual return character there or anything. Uh, if it is indeed a pointer to the n, it can be indexed like any other pointer. And the index plus three or fourth character is the w down there. And then recall from earlier segments that indexing a pointer includes a free D reference. So it is literally the character W, not its address, that is passed to printf. And thus a percent %C specifier is in order. And this is a good example of distinguishing between a pointer and its target. And if you give printf a string pointer, you should give it a percent %S format specifier. But if you give it a character, it's percent %C. You'll uh, sometimes see string constant used, indexed in this way, to pick one character out of a related set. Uh, NESW, for instance, is supposed to stand for the four points of the compass. And so we finally come to quote, quote, plus one. Now, to understand this, we need to look at the empty string constant, quote, quote. It represents a pointer to something. But what? To answer this, first be sure you see that a one-character string constant, like perhaps a quote x quote, results in two bytes in the string table, x and null. I just drew an arrow from our quote x quote constant in line 39 to its entry in the string table.
And again, you can see there must be a null after the x. You always have to have that null. So if we reduce the constant down to just empty quotes, it makes sense that there will be one byte in the string table, just the null, and that the empty quotes will represent a pointer to that null. And so here's what we really have by virtue of the empty quotes. And a pointer to just a null. Okay. Now a pointer directly to the terminating null is the ultimate in really short strings. And it's worth going back over the stir comp and stir copy code, by the way, to convince yourself that they work in this boundary case. So question eight. How does stir copy work if the source points directly to the null? Does anything get copied to the target string? And uh, how does stir comp work if you pass a pointer to the null for one of its parameters? Is an empty string less than or greater than a normal string, and why? Trace the code in each case and give a concrete answer. So coming back from a pause tracing that code, stir copy will copy just the null across to the uh, target string, and then the while loop exits, and because the assignment has value zero. And that's as it should be. The target string would now also be an empty string, just like the source, immediately ended with a null. And stir comp will also work, with the for loop exiting immediately, since one of the strings is already, quote, done, unquote. And the return statement will do a subtraction between the null of the empty string and the non-null first letter of the non-empty string. The empty string is thus automatically less than any other string. So now that we have a handle on the empty string, let's look at the uh, quote quote plus one. Uh, I might have printed just empty quotes, but that would be boring as it would predictably have printed nothing. Uh, instead, I decided to end the example code with a bug, uh, which the quote plus one certainly is. Um, so question nine, why is it a bug? And what pointer value then is being passed to printf? And what result might that produce? Um, I've left actually the output as question, 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 because it's really not clear what it would do. I just want you to predict where it would get what it's going to print from, so you understand what kind of weird thing the bug might do. So think carefully about how this works in the context of the string table, and uh, see what, uh, what you come up with. And from coming back from a pause, the plus one increments the pointer past the one null character in the empty string to the beginning of whatever lies beyond. And that is a bug. The empty string is in the string table, adjacent to other string constants. In whatever, in this case, it would be some other string constant after the empty string. And uh, we couldn't be sure what it would be, but it would pop up surprisingly in the middle of our printf output, uh, whatever it, uh, it was. It would run differently on every compiler and uh, on every machine. Depends on how the string table is organized.